is my first time doing this, so go with me and I get kind of rusty. You're going to do fine. All right, so this morning I just want to share a little something. Um, okay, this morning I just want to share a little bit about my testimony. And if you're taking notes, um, today the um, message is going to be called Real Love. So if you're writing down, um, just label it Real Love. Um, starting in 2009, I was in Myrtle Beach, um, South Carolina with my family. And we were having a great week, um, going throughout the week, going to all these fun places, the beach, um, Ferris Foot Island, whatever that's called, um, going through all these cool places. And on the way back home, we um, stopped at McDonald's that morning to go home. And uh, I believe it was on a Friday or Saturday. And we stopped at McDonald's. And um, real quick to let you guys know, um, growing up, I saw my dad singing and stuff. But throughout that time, I never wanted to be a musician. I never wanted to be a singer. But the little things dad did, I wanted to do. So like, if he got a lawnmower and he's mowing the grass, I would get a little play lawnmower. And I would act like I'm mowing the grass. If he watched the news, I would eat. Watch the news. If he eats steak, I would eat steak. Does that make sense? I didn't want to be the musician, guys. So we walk into McDonald's and we're getting breakfast to leave. And I see Dad stop at a home. Um, there's a computer. There's a TV up um, in the air, and he's looking at it just like this, watching the news right before you walk in the door. So I look over, and he's eyes on the uh, the news. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go over there, cross my arms, and watch the news. I'm like, I'm like eight years old, I'm gonna do what he does. So I'm standing right there and I watch the news too. And he's telling me about this guy named Michael Jackson passing away. And it was all over the news. Michael Jackson, pop star, passing away. I remember hearing it. And he's like, he's flipping out. He's like, oh, man. And I look and I'm like, oh. <laughs> He's like, Zach, do you know who this is? I was like, no, I, sadly I don't. Who is he? And so he tells me who he is. Um, so riding home, I got this Michael Jackson guy in my head. Jonathan's like playing at office his phone. Um, man, oh, man behind the hammer, what am I about to say? Um, man in the mirror, man in the mirror. <laughs> He's um, playing all these songs, right? And I'm like, okay, so I'm not really paying attention. Like they're showing me in the car like who he is, but I'm not fully there yet. So I get home. And uh, Jonathan at the time had um, a little desk, and he had a um, nice mic and a um, laptop where we recorded stuff, just some songs we did on the computer, free far and post on YouTube, embarrassing, so we deleted them. Um, so um, growing up, so I get at the desk and I search um, Michael Jackson um, on YouTube. So the first song that comes up is um, Man in the Mirror. So I was like, okay, I'll listen to it. I remember listening to that two to three hours non-stop push and replay. I watched a live version. I'm a fan of live versions. So like, um, I'm watching it and Michael, he comes out, he's in a white suit, he's on stage, black hair all the way, you know, hit, like all that good stuff. <laughs> and um, he's hitting all the moves on him. And um, so he's performing Man in the Mirror and I listen to it. So I start to sing and Jonathan's like, dude, look up, I'll be there. So I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll look up, I'll be there. Um, you know that song, I'll be there, I'll be there, just call my name, I'll be there, that one. So I saw that from um, 2009 to 2013, a, a lot of times, um, but Jonathan was like, let's learn it. So he goes, we go in the basement, and he starts to play on the piano, and I'm singing, and Jonathan starts to flip out, he's like, okay, so I, Zach, Zach can sing, so um, he calls dad down there, and dad comes in, and he's like, Zach, you have a talent, let's use it. So first time ever playing, I was in fifth grade, and dad's doing like some um, assembly at my school. And he's like, um, Zach, would you like to play, John can play I'll Be There while you sing it in front of your whole student body? I'm like, sure. So like, I'm sweating, I'm like, okay, let's do it. So I was never the coolest guy in school, I and mean, usually step out of myself, that kind of, kind of guy. So, but let me tell you, after I sung, things change. <laughs> I get out there and I sing, and um, people I never talked to was up in the bleachers like, dude, come down here. <laughs> so I get out there and I start hanging out. Well, um, so it's 2009 to 2013, um, I sung with Dad, going everywhere he went. Um, I opened up with I'll Be There. I would sing. Um, Bruno Mars songs, all these different types of songs. But yet did I know, yes, I'm singing in churches. Yes, I'm, tr um, I'm learning about Jesus. My dad's teaching me about Jesus. But 
Am I close to him? I wasn't even close to him. And um, yet did I know about how close his real love is to me and how close I didn't even recognize it. So um, long story short, um, 2013 came around and I go to Crossroads Summer Camp first year. It was one of the best summers of my life. I'll never forget. I went with Jeremiah, Jacob, Julia, Emily, Michael, Andrea, Dylan, Clifton, um, some in our old youth group. Sorry if I forget you. Um, some people in our old youth group, we went and it was awesome. I remember John, I mean, um, Jeremiah made commitments about forgiving his dad. Um, a bunch of other people made big commitments and I thought it was really incredible. And um, still, that year, it hit me knowing Jesus. So, like, <coughs> yes, I'm a Christian. I follow Jesus. But yet, at this moment, I'm, still, I'm learning about him. So, I come back, and Dad asks Jeremiah to lead the youth. And he does. And he asked me what I like to lead worship for them. So, I'm learning all these Michael Jackson songs. Like, they're, like, sing worship. And I'm like, man, I, I don't know worship songs. All I know is I'll be there and beat it. So, like, <laughs> that's, that's all I know. I'll do that on Thursday night. First song I learned um, on the guitar was Give Me Faith. It's like, give me faith to trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my life. It goes something like that. So first, first worship song I ever learned. So we played that for a year straight, only song, every, every Thursday. <laughs> So 2015, no, 2000, December of 2014, I'm still serving Jesus. I'm still at this point doing youth group, singing one song on Thursday, <laughs> same song at this time. Well, 2014 comes around, December, and Jeremiah and I start thinking, hey, we play really well together. Let's do an album. I'm like, an album? Okay, let's, let's do it. So we came up with something called The Journey, and I thought that this thing was going to be the jank, okay? I thought this was going to be the stuff, right? So we start getting in the studio, well, I started getting in the studio recording the first stuff for the guitar and vocals. Um, the, now, this album was not a worship album. It was a love album, um, just love songs. We start writing them. Um, I know that kind of sounds weird, but we did write them, and they did sound decent. We wrote, um, <laughs> we wrote 10 songs in two months. We got it done. That's pretty hard, really hard to do. 10 songs in two months. So I'm like, okay, let's do this. I'm getting in the studio. I'm recording. He's waiting to go in to do his part. Well, um, what I didn't know is um, 2015 summer camp is coming around the corner. And I'm like, okay, so summer camp's coming up. Um, I go in there. I'm still hyped about doing this album at the moment. It's a, it's a long progress. We weren't going in there every day, but I know like this was going to be the stuff, and I thought it was going to be awesome. But yet that I know Jesus had a different plan, and he's going, he's about to reverse it. Six months I waste, not necessarily wasting, but wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing, what I should be focusing on. If you um, write notes, I would suggest you write this down. Um, Jesus loves you just the way you are, but he loves you way too much to keep you that way. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Amen. I don't know what that means. He loved me in 2009 to 2013, what I was doing with my dad, and singing all these different types of songs, <laughs> but he loved me way too much to keep me that way meaning he had better plans for me. Amen. Amen. So first point I want to make, um, well, actually 2015, Crossroads comes around, and long story short, I said yes to full-time ministry and made that commitment. It was the biggest commitment I've ever made, and it will always be the biggest commitment I've ever made compared to any jobs I take or anything like that. So full-time ministry and youth ministry is a big part of my life, and that's what I made in 2015. So first point I want to make is real love is aware. You write that down. And the verse is going to be Jeremiah 29 11, so if you flip through your Bibles and that. And um, the point again is real love is aware. Um, 
So in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. So during this time of um, singing and saying yes to full-time ministry, that verse really hits me because this, he knows you so well, for I have the plans um, to prosper you, not to harm you. Does anyone know what that means? He has plans to give you a brighter future than you could ever imagine. And I just think that blows my mind that he knows us so well because uh, I don't know what verse it is, and, but he said he knew, he knows you before you were yet in your mother's womb. So he knows your calling and he knows um, what your life calling is. So I think that's really cool. I just want to share something I've been learning in Bible class. Um, we've been learning some pretty deep stuff in Bible class, and I want to show you something that, um, who's ever heard of evolution? <laughs> evolution. So um, tell me if you've heard of this word right now. Okay? Anyone's heard of that? Yeah. Big Bang. Okay? So this is Big Bang, and going from that, going from that, okay? You guys can just sit down. Good morning, first grade. Um, so going from Big Bang, product of nature. We descended from the Big Bang. And then product of nature, we're just, hey, we're just here for no absolute reason. This is what evolution believes, right? So going from product of nature, I have no free will. Um, in Bible class, we learn about what they believe, and this is not what I believe, I'm just opening up so you guys listen to this. Um, some of you might not know what this means. So Big Bang, I'm a product of nature. We descended from the Big Bang. Um, question, when's the last time you've blown up something and it fixed a problem? <laughs> I'm a robot. I have free will. No, I have no free will. I'm a robot. <laughs> That, this is meaning that my brain is just a computer. I'm doing what nature is allowing itself to do. That's what evolution believes. Big Bang. I'm a product of nature. I'm just here for no reason. I have no free will. This right here, this part right here, right? Pre wired. They believe that this is pre wired. God knows your destination. So, so if He creates you and He knows that you are going to hell, or you're going to heaven, you have no free will. That means that this, he knows you already. So, why, why do we have free will? This doesn't make sense. Does this make sense? I have no free will because of this. And this is also what they said. Okay, let me get something here. Um, I can't make a truth. I can't, cannot make a truth. Oh, I'm sorry, my grammar is awful. <laughs> I can't make a truth claim. I cannot make a truth claim. Right? But, I just made one. So evolution is say, this happened. I'm a product of nature. This is all pre-wired. I'm a robot, but I can't make a truth claim. Does this make any sense? How can you say this is true, but I can't make a truth claim, right? So again, why I'm teaching you guys this is this is all like this is not real love. This is this can't happen. Like Jesus, I'm gonna give you guys examples so you're with me. This um, when they say it's pre-wired and I had no free will, that's not true. Right now, I have the free will to keep preaching, or I have the free will to get this guitar and sing. Do I not? I have the free will to do that right now. You cannot say I can't. I can't do it. I I have an opportunity to pick one of these. And um, for example, when I get up in the morning, my dad's my witness. First thing I do is get a bowl of tricks and I sit down on the couch and I watch Fox News with them. That's the first thing I do every morning. Get a bowl of tricks and I watch Fox News. Do I not? Every morning. But do I have the freedom to pop waffles in the toasters and watch SpongeBob? I do. Is he allowing me? Will he let me do it? Yes. But why? Why? Listen. Why does he know 
that I'm going to get a short shirt to watch Fox News. It's a habit, but my father knows me. <laughs> Just like our Heavenly Father knows us. He knows the routes we're going to take. He knew that this, me preaching this morning, that had to happen. So all of this going on, it's no question about it. That there is completely free will. And if you can't make a truth claim, don't say, oh, this is true. And have no reason to back it up. So going back to Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but to give you a hope in the future. So our Father knows us. He is aware. Real love is aware. All right? All right, so going from that, um, I can, I'm not going to erase that. So <laughs> real love is aware. Second point I want to make to you guys is real love waits. And the verse for that is Revelation 3.20. Thank you. Shout out. <coughs> Sorry, I have kind of a cold. Stop that. It's hard to say. Revelation 3.20. You guys there? This is what it says. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come up and eat with that person and they with me. So real love waits. Jesus waits for you. He's not a um, harmful God. He's not um, shouting. He's not very loud. He's not pushing you to love him. Me and Jamie, about two or three months ago, was, um, we were actually um, at the, what's that place right there at your house um, where we drive, drive and stuff? Um, industrial Park. Anyone heard of that? Industrial Park, that's nice. All right. Well, we were there. He was actually, we were in his car. He was te teaching me how to drive a stick. So um, that didn't go well. It was like, <laughs> Um, Jeremiah, he did, um, yeah, he did good. <laughs> uh, um, me, on the other hand, didn't do so well. But we're talking in the car, and he goes, you know, um, Zach, Jesus' love is so real. He's so gentle with us. Like, if he was a very harmful God, now, if I, Mr. Owens, if I took you to a um, landfill in Arizona, I dug a hole and I threw you in it, and I said, the only way you can get food is if you love me. And that's the only way you can survive. You would eventually start loving me, correct? If you needed food, right? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus is not like that. Stay with me. Jesus is not like that. Jesus puts us here on earth and he goes, you know, I'm here waiting for you. If you open, I'll come again. Is that real love, God? That's that's the realest love I think you could have. Like he's not he's not begging him to come in. He's just saying, hey, you open, I'm here. So he's loving. His love is gentle. Third and last final point. Um, real love, guys, is the cross. I'm going to flip in the Bible to Matthew 27. You don't have to flip there. I just want every heart and soul open to what I'm about to read to you guys, all right? Matthew 27, 19 through 26, this is what it says. Has anyone heard the story of Barabbas and Jesus? I see no hands going up. What's going on? Barabbas and Jesus. All right, so right here in verse 19, starting in verse 19. While Pilate was sitting on the judge seat, his wife sent him a message saying, Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask Barabbas and have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release? The governor asked. They said, you know, give us Barabbas. What shall I then do to Jesus who's called the Messiah? Pilate asked. Then they answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted aloud, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but instead an uproar against the crowd, he took water and washed his hands and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, His blood is on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And he said, Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Let me tell you guys, if you don't see real love in this passage, something is completely wrong. Amen. I know reading it, you're like, oh, I don't see real love. Barabbas, a criminal, is being released, but the Son of God 
the Messiah, he's done nothing but hell. He's getting in order to be crucified. We don't understand that. The Pharisees, Pilate asked them, who do you want? And they're like, give us Barabbas, but what about the Son of God? He's done nothing but hell. Restore. All, um, make the blind see all of this. Who do you guys want? Well, you know, give us Barabbas. We'll take Barabbas. So, the Roman soldiers come up and they unbuckle um, the shackles from Barabbas' feet. Let me tell you guys, it wasn't the Pharisees and the people who let Jesus go. It was the law from the Heavenly Father who let him go. You guys with me still? It was the law from the Heavenly Father. See, for Jesus knew that the Father had to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. That's good stuff. You could write it down. Hear me? Let me say that again. The Father knew that he had to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye school. Guys, when I, look, when I look at this story and I really dig deep into it, I look and see who Barabbas really is. Barabbas is me. Barabbas is you. Barabbas is us. How many times do we have the chains and the shackles taken off and we look to Jesus and we say, Jesus, thank you for everything you've done, but instead walk away? How many times does that happen? Guys, today, if you have taken the chains off and you want to know what's next and you want to go um, live your life for Jesus, guys, I'm going to open up the altar now. The next step to having those chains and shackles taken off is to now go to the cross and take it up. Guys, in John, he says, My burden is light. Give me your shame, son. I will take that up, and I will carry your burdens. He says it in John. I, um, you might be thinking, Oh, but Father, I have forsaken you so many times. I don't know what to do. I, um, I've... I don't know what to do. I gave you my shame, but I've hurt you once. I'm scared I'm going to hurt you again. You know what he says? He says, give me your shame. When they asked Barabbas, when they asked the Pharisees, who do you want? They said, give us Barabbas. You know what Jesus said? He said, it's fine, Father. Let him have Barabbas. I'll take this. That's my son. You're probably thinking that Barabbas is a filthy man and he would never accept Jesus or realize the love that was shown to him that day. But let me tell you something. That is a child of God. The Father, Father above said, that's my son. That is my son. I'm going to die for him. I'll take this. You let them have Barabbas. I will take this one. Yep. Guys, the altar is now open. If you're going to take up the cross, take that up today.